thank you, um, uh, Bill, for these kind words. And not, not to uh, just coldly reciprocate, but to truly voice uh, a feeling that I have. Um, we are very lucky to have Bill Kovacic here today, and I am certainly very honored to be talking under his control, a uh, true missionary of uh, competition globally. Uh, he's probably one of the few persons that I know who travels even more than I do travel, so uh, he did from uh, Marrakech, and uh, we really truly appreciate it. Um, uh, today I'll be presenting a paper uh, that uh, we have written together with my colleagues uh, that I would like to introduce to you. Uh, they're all here today. Aisha Gunad is a senior associate at our law firm uh, and a member of uh, California Bar uh, over there. And uh, Janelle Filson is uh, right next to her, where else? Uh, and Janelle, it, uh, in her good old days, was with Elie. Now she's doing something else. Uh, and uh, uh, she's uh, a member of the New York Bar. Uh, and uh, she's been a tremendous asset to our law firm when she was working with us. Uh, Sinan Diniz uh, is uh, over there. Uh, and uh, he is actually uh, working on bankruptcy uh, law issues right now because he's trying to get his uh, reciprocity as he's a uh, JD of Georgetown University. And uh, he holds a degree from uh, the US Law School, so he's trying to qualify in Turkey. And uh, Sinan had uh, particularly uh, a very significant contribution to this uh, paper. Uh, uh, I had the privilege of uh, receiving uh, wonderful remarks from uh, Bill, and uh, I should say that Sinan had a lot to do with its quality. So uh, the overview is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about law and economics theory regarding uh, most favored nation clauses. And then I'm going to talk to you about the, the legal cases uh, that are discussing uh, the uh, MFNs. I will be referring to them as MFNs after I describe what that is to you. And uh, finally, we'll be throwing in the idea of having guidelines on most favored nation clauses in a better handling of it in competition law. To put out our thesis, which is a, a reading between the lines kind of exercise for the purposes of the paper, but it should be said out loud uh, when presenting this paper, um, our main thesis is that um, the MFN clauses are truly delicate, frail, fragile animals of uh, free contract. And therefore, if the current handling of MFN clauses in a very fudging environment, in a very uh, difficult to predict environment were to continue, then it is highly likely that people will not be engaging in MFN clauses in the foreseeable future. And that may not be in all given circumstances efficiency enhancing. So conversely, what we are saying is, yes, we recognize that the MFN clauses might be having uh, certain, uh, uh, certain anti-competitive effects in given fact circumstances, but we, if we can secure a predictable environment through guidelines, then we can pro protect MFN clauses and that would be efficiency enhancing because ultimately the MFN clauses are not all evil. And uh, yet the very complex handling of, of MFN clauses might lead to the result that they are seen uh, to be as such. Ömür Bey, burada yer var, buyursunlar. So what is a most favored nation clause, uh, which is uh, an MFN? It is basically an agreement by which the seller agrees. So it's a, it's a commitment at the seller's side. The seller agrees to use the most beneficial terms that that seller, agree, uh, that seller uses uh, with a certain uh, counterpart uh, 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 with the others. So in, in uh, shorter terms, basically, what's happening with an MFN clause is the brewer, for example, uh, says to the bottling company, OK, I'm getting my bottling uh, from you, but I would like to know that these bottles are being provided to me on terms that are no worse than the other bottling companies are getting it uh, uh, from you. Uh, sorry, the other uh, brewers are getting it from you. So I, I would just like to comfort myself that I am not being taken in this negotiation and these are the best terms available in the marketplace. 
when you look at it that way, and that has been the way of the US antitrust law at the beginning of it, it just prima facie looks like a good thing. So uh, when you uh, take a snapshot of that instance where that negotiation is happening, that particular negotiation of a, a, an MFN clause makes you feel that the prices are going to go down and there is some aggressivity in the marketplace and that's a good thing and that's uh, enhancing uh, competition. But when you look at it as a process, as you should always in competition law matters and not as a snapshot of uh, a particular uh, occurrence of the marketplace, the process plays out sometimes as the MFN clause basically shifting the, um, the pricing behavior. And uh, you start seeing that the existence of the MFN clauses sometimes in certain given circumstances are leading to a situation where it becomes more and more expensive for the seller to be providing reduced prices, especially to new entrants of the market. So it is more difficult for the seller to be more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis certain counterparts. And so uh, it's not always efficiency enhancing, and uh, it is very confusing, obviously, to the parties that are engaging in MFN clauses, uh, which, uh, by way of inference, comes to a point after the e-books uh, handling in the US and the uh, EU jurisdictions and the healthcare sector inquiries and the, uh, uh, the typical handling of these matters uh, in uh, certain other sectors in the EU, that uh, your everyday client might just say, you know what, this is too confusing. I just can't understand if the MFN clause in and of itself is a bad thing, so I'm just going to do away with it which is what we're trying to prevent and which is what we're trying to say with this particular paper that ultimately there are certain transaction costs that are being dealt with and it should be a good thing. First of all, as a, as a token of law and economics in general, um, these are two freely contracting parties with free will and uh, the presumption is in their favor that there's going to be some kind of efficiency gain through this. So for us to prohibit it, we have to comfort ourselves that this is to be prohibited. And yet uh, the uh, case law is going uh, to such a direction that there may be so many reasons why these are being prohibited uh, on a given uh, case circumstance that uh, private undertakings not able to particularly understand when it is illegal and when it, when it is not may just move away from uh, uh, MFN clauses entirely and that's just not uh, ideal. So what are we talking about uh, when we say MFN uh, arrangements? Obviously, because it's a, it's a byproduct of free will, there are very many forms of it. Uh, one form of it is MFN plus, which is the most aggressive type of it, uh, where the buyer is not guaranteed a matching of the best available price, but rather the buyer is guaranteed that the price that the seller is giving to that particular buyer is the best price available and there is no price beating it, and there won't be. Now, again, looking at that particular uh, instance, it seems like aggressive price negotiation, so we should allow it. But looking at it from the perspective of what is happening to the other players, actually it's not that ideal, or it may not be, depending also on the market power of the, of the participants of this, uh, of this particular arrangement. So when it is the lowest price, there is a discrimination element to it as well, and that's why MFN Plus is to be uh, reviewed carefully. It should be scrutinized carefully. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of retail MFNs, but uh, actually this is uh, the type of MFN that is attracting a lot of attention in the US because uh, ultimately what you're looking at is, especially in uh, two-sided sectors and platform sectors, such as healthcare, for example, where uh, health insurers are bringing patients to the hospitals and insurers themselves are a good platform for the hospitals to get access to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patients. And uh, conversely, uh, they are also a good platform for the, uh, the healthcare patients to be able to choose between different uh, hospitals. There, when you go in with MFN clauses and say uh, to the insurer as the hospital, uh, this is the best uh, uh, available uh, parameter that I'm going to offer and I'm not going to offer it to any other insurer, uh, you 
quickly start seeing that there are certain decaying uh, uh, in uh, or uh, certain uh, problems in the uh, handling of the platform overall, and that the behavior of the platform may not be uh, as competitive as it was before, for reasons I'm going to explain. Retroactive MFNs are uh, 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 typically a problem where you claw back certain part of uh, uh, what, you, what should have been your price. That also comes with auditing clauses, and typically these are the types of contracts that we see in the in the uh, private uh, practice of antitrust law very frequently as well. So what the parties say is, you know what, uh, to the ex extent uh, you have given a better price to uh, a counterpart, I will be able to see it because I'm going to audit what you're doing, and then I'm going to claw it back, the difference. So there's going to be a price difference invoicing relationship. Now that makes the market too transparent, that also uh, makes sure that there is a controlling relationship between the seller and the buyer of the relationship. So typically when it has a retroactive effect, we're uh, again offering that there be a, a, a higher degree of scrutiny. I've also talked about the auditing and enforcement rights. This, these you typically see with retroactive MFNs, but you might be seeing it in other contexts as well. So what then are, and I, I'm going to be a bit quick about these particular slides because I've been telling about uh, these to you uh, uh, in uh, different sections of my speech. Uh, what are the justifications for MFNs? First, the idea is that there's going to be lower prices. If there was not this storyline, by this time, MFN would have been entirely annihilated anyway. So the, uh, the idea is that there is some form of a lower price and the buyer wants this lower price, and that's why there is a most favored nation clause in there. So isn't there something worthwhile to protect? And in most instances, uh, there is. But then um, uh, there is also the idea, uh, now we're talking about justifications, that uh, reduced transaction costs and agreement continuity uh, is a good thing. Uh, this is not the type of transaction cost I was talking about earlier. This is the transaction cost of engaging in the transaction and the bargaining of a better price. You just don't engage in that kind of a uh, discussion again and again. So it's efficiency enhancing because you know the deal that you're getting. It uh, makes the marketplace more predictable from a bargaining perspective. And uh, because you know what you're going to get, you're also uh, solving some other problems that come with, uh, uh, with bargaining your uh, contracts, such as um, protecting your platform and brand value. Now, here, this justification has taken a, a significant hit with the e-books uh, uh, case, because with the e-books case handling, basically, the counsel to, um, to uh, Apple uh, and Amazon, they have tried their best with coming up with all of the justifications and arguments on platform and brand value, basically alleging that uh, to the extent there is an MFN clause, and, and there, are, there are MFN clauses in there, uh, it is good for the marketplace because the platform is predictable in its uh, pricing, and the people buying their books online are not feeling the need to compare prices so aggressively as they feel that it's just a, a, a channel that they use. And they don't, uh, they don't feel cheated on, if you will. And that does not hurt the image of, uh, or, or rather, that helps with the image of online purchasing. So what they say is that this is good for the protection of uh, the platform. We have uh, Mr. Ismail Hakkı Karakelle with us today, who has been uh, um, everything to the Turkish Competition Authority for uh, such a long time. And he will remember uh, the years in, in 1997 when um, there were the very first investigations in Turkey, and I was representing certain companies, and he was uh, at the Competition Authority, where there was a very favorite argument with Turkish businesses where they said it is a matter of brand image. We have to have higher prices because brand images are going to be hurt. No one ever says this now. Uh, in 2014, this is something that you laugh at and, and that's just you know uh, not a competition law argument that you run anymore. It is possible that this platform and brand value argument is going to fall into that kind of a category as far as the MFN clauses are concerned, because the platform value is more and more receding to 
a, uh, a route that only talks about the image of the, of the channel and not, mu uh, not much more. Whereas the reduced delays issue is extremely significant, where in the reduced delays uh, matter, there could really be certain modelings of cases where the, um, the model would give you the result that it is efficiency enhancing every time. So what's happening is there are uh, buyers, uh, uh, there is one, uh, a, a uh, group of sellers and there is a buyer, and the group of sellers need to complete the sale collectively so that it means something to the buyer, like uh, buying a piece of land from partitioned uh, uh, stakeholders, for example. There are seven stakeholders of a land, I'm going to build something on it, but I need to buy all seven of these parcels, otherwise it's just not going to help me at all. So as I start buying one by one, one of the hurdles that I deal with is that the holders of the buyers, uh, the holders of the parcels have an incentive to cling on to their property and wait uh, to be the last one. Whoever becomes the last to sell the parcel is going to get a higher premium on it. And because it is a game theoretical, uh, game theoretical kind of circumstance where everybody knows the other uh, parties move, suddenly there's a stalemate. Well, by way of injecting MFN clauses in there, you could actually diffuse and you could actually penetrate and uh, lead to a result whereby you have uh, achieved uh, uh, better handling. And reduced price competition, uh, obviously, uh, is the potential harm of MFNs. This is now being discussed more loudly. Uh, so to the extent there is an MFN clause, it might be leading to the fact that uh, uh, people are running the argument that their hands are tied. And uh, of course, exclusion, I think, is uh, perhaps the biggest uh, problem where MFN raises rivals costs, as it is seen, you can see it in the paper as well, as it is seen in certain cases uh, in, uh, uh, in, for example, digitalization of movie theater uh, output. The, uh, the basic idea is that independent uh, movie theaters are not able to penetrate in the, into the market and are not able to work with the integrators anymore. Integrators are people who are digitalizing uh, the movie theaters because there is an, an MFN clause between the, uh, the bigger movie theaters Let's, let's give an example from our uh, country, uh, AFME, uh, Mars, for example, and Warner Bros. and uh, Disney's of the world. Because they have an MFN clause in there, it gets too expensive for them to deal with the independent uh, movie theaters on different bases. Whereas if they were to be left alone and if there were no such clauses, then probably they were going to take advantage of the given situation and they were going to say, listen, this is no Warner Bros. or Disney that we're negotiating with, but there is still money, money to be made, so I'm just going to give them more favorable terms because they're smaller and, and that's what they can pay. Because it's not always a matter of economies of scale that leads what the prices are. Sometimes it is just the opportunity. And the provider is unable to seize the opportunity because uh, the provider feels, well, you know what? If I were to give the independent uh, movie theater a better um, term for integration into the di digitalization, then suddenly I'm going to be liable with a, a gigantic amount vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the off-MMRs type uh, uh, chains of movie theaters, and that's just going to be too costly, even perhaps uh, higher than the gains that I'm going to get in this particular transaction. So before you know it, the independent uh, contractors, uh, sorry, the independent movie houses are actually unable to shift themselves to a digitalized marketplace, where the content is now put on display like that. So they're being excluded from the marketplace. So I'm not going to go into each and every one of the, the cases, and I'm wary of my timing, so I'm wrapping up in uh, two, three minutes at most. Uh, 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 but what I tried to do uh, uh, is that I have embedded a lot of my slides into these slides. I'm also trying to comfort my team who know that there are a lot of slides that I have not covered, but uh, uh, I think uh, this was a better way of interactively presenting it uh, to you. So um, basically what it does is um, uh, these M MFN clauses on a case-by-case -case basis might be very uh, beneficial or they might be uh, very anti-competitive. 
uh, and it might be also a hotbed of collusion, obviously. So I'm now doing uh, away with the uh, uh, legal cases in the United States. It's uh, extensively written in the paper. I'm not going to uh, go into the details of that, and I have explained quite a bit of that uh, already. Uh, one thing that I would like to take note of is that we're, uh, as a jurisdiction, we're not entirely oblivious to the uh, MFN clauses. And actually, the Turkish Competition Authority has taken interest in 2010 in uh, the MFN clauses uh, between Sony Europe and Arcelik. It was a toll manufacturing agreement containing MFN requiring Arcelik uh, to provide Sony Europe uh, ter terms equally favorable as terms provided to others. The Competition Authority kind of used this, as they sometimes do, and I, I like that very much, uh, as an opportunity to speak about the topic. A lot of the, the analysis in there was really not invited by the, by the case at hand because they, it, it was a benign arrangement and uh, you could have just said, green light, go ahead. But while we're at it, the competition authority said, here are the types of MFN clauses that might uh, irk us, that might give us uh, uh, the reason to raise an eyebrow. Uh, but uh, we're not going to do that in this particular in instance because. So almost the Turkish Competition Authority is paving the way for me to say now it's time for a guideline because it's not going to be sufficient to speak uh, every five years when that odd MFN case comes uh, your way. Typically where MFN case, and that's uh, an important sentence in my view, typically where the MFN clauses are, uh, uh, are born, or uh, the MFN clauses die is without the knowledge of the competition authority. It is the free will and the contracting stage and the negotiation stage. So if you confuse the climate too much with your signals, then it's just not going to be born and you won't even know about the, the loss of efficiency there. And that's why you need to protect with a guideline. So the idea of the, uh, the leading uh, competition authorities of the world, um, uh, and I would, I would love to see uh, a guideline from one of the leading competition authorities in the world so that uh, it has a locomotive power, um, uh, should not be whether they're dealing with MFN clauses all the time, whether this warrants that kind of an attention, why are we coming up with a guideline, we're not even looking at more than five uh, cases uh, a year. They should just know that it is a natural instinct of parties to go for MFN clauses. There are very many instances where this is natural, and it may not happen if a guideline is uh, not holding their hands. And yes, it will not be coming before them because it, ha it has to be uh, a very exceptional circumstance that it hits the uh, records of, the, uh, of, the, of any competition authority. So with that, uh, basically, we are giving a proposal for a particular guideline. I have already given you what that guideline should be all about, so I'm not going to go over uh, the things that I have said. And my last sentence, therefore, uh, on this is going to be a big thank you for, for bearing with me for so long. Thank you very much, Gonench, and uh, my apologies to your co-authors for not introducing them as well. As you began your work, uh, if, uh, uh, Aisha, Janelle, and Sinan, I should know better. Uh, I, I, I have a uh, co-authored work with two other colleagues in the U.S., and the, uh, I am the second in the list, and the citation format for U.S. journals is that where there are three or more co-authors, they only mention the first one. And the others are called et al. Uh, uh, and uh, Andy Gavel is the lead author, so the volume is Gavel et al. So uh, among us, I'm known as et, and John Baker is al. Uh, <laughs>